Good noon, everyone, and uh, thanks for hanging around for this last part of the day. Uh, and I'm going to try and uh, cover quite a lot of ground uh, in, in a, quite a high level. And But the reason that I wanted to talk about the SERF project in this context is because it's very easy to think that in a fieldwork project that once the stuff, the excavations, the surveys and all those kind of things have finished, that the project sort of comes to an end. And in fact, the SERF project is, is something that's um, going to be happening for quite a long time, despite the fact that the fieldwork phase is now finished. So we don't really know quite what the end point of the project will be. So I thought it'd be quite useful just to summarise some of the, the key headlines of what the project has achieved, but also to talk a little bit about some of the post-excavation work that's ongoing and also the, the writing up strategy. And I've just finished a, a period of eight months of research leave where I've spent most of my time working on one of the monographs that's um, a result of the um, excavations at Fortivia. But part of that process has also been working on other papers and trying to pull together all sorts of other bits and pieces. So despite the fact that the last time that I um, stuck a trowel in the ground in the SERF project was in 20, uh, 2016, or 2015, um, I've been working on it more intensively now than I was when um, we were doing the field work. Uh, and this, this, this whole um, process is, involves a huge team of people, uh, and uh, in particular, not just the, the co-directors of the project, uh, Steve Driscoll, Ewan Campbell, uh, and uh, various others who have been involved, but also a big team of people who have been involved in looking at lots of the post-excavation work. It's been a monumental effort, and we've been uh, fortunate to have very um, generous funding from Historic Environment Scotland throughout, and including, for instance, funding my some of my research leave time to work on this project. So I'll talk a bit about um, some of these things as we go on. And so we've had these two phases of field work around for TV, uh, and then the environs, which essentially for the, for what I was doing was around the village of Dunning, um, to the south uh, west of Perth, and then we've now got this very long writing up and legacy part of the the project. The project itself, uh, in the Strathairn Environs and Royal Fortivit project, um, initially started with a, a bit of trial geophysics around uh, Fortivit in 2006. And, um, and the project has always focused on three parishes uh, to, in, in Upper Strathairn, Fortivit, uh, Dunning and Forgandenny. And we've, the project has had a, a very broad scope in terms of what we've looked at. And a lot of what I'm going to talk about here is the prehistoric element of the project. Uh, there's all sorts of other strands as well, which I can't talk to so uh, comprehensively. Uh, and this is a writing up process is a good time to reflect on the the various different things that happened over the course of the project, including the fact that we just we just did so much that it's actually daunting to try and make sense of it all now. And in a sense, we didn't actually over ten years take a breath and pause and reflect on what was going on to an extent um, that we now are. It's, it's now um, something which is. Uh, taking up far too much of my life to try and make sense of. The project itself started off with a very simple objective, I guess, which was based on various different interests we had in the archaeology department at Glasgow. Steve Driscoll did his PhD looking at the potential reuse of a prehistoric monumental landscape at Fortiviat that then became the er an early capital, a royal centre in Scotland, with supposedly a Pictish palace and the sort of the seat of power of King Kenneth MacAlpin. Uh, and this kind of this spatial proximity of an enormous crop mark complex of Neolithic and Bronze Age monuments identified by St Joseph in the 1970s, and this historic record of uh, early medieval Fortivia is something that Steve had wanted to explore for a long time. And so, at the time in the department, uh, Gordon Noble was there as well, who's now gone to the very dark side of the Picts. And uh, we were so Gordon and I took on the prehistoric side of the project, and Steve and you and looked at the early medieval side. So we had wanted to look at explore this long-term use of a landscape. Um, and in particular, we're interested, for instance, you know, in Fortivia, where is the palace? Um, where is the, the, the early medieval activity at Fortivia? Because a lot of this was based on written records. And what, if any, is the connection between the prehistoric activity? And, and to some extent, we were very successful at identifying connections and very tangible connections between the prehistoric use of Fortivia and early medieval to the extent that the, the Picts appeared to take great delight in destroying prehistoric archaeological sites, um, which made our life more difficult. Um, but in terms of other things like the project, like where was um, Kenneth McAlpin's palace, that was one of the less successful elements of the project, despite the fact that the Daily Record back in about 2008 claimed that the Boffins had found the palace, um, but uh, they, they hadn't actually. We, just, we thought we knew where it was and then we excavated and it wasn't there, but uh, anyway. 
But that's that's Steve Driscoll's lookout, not mine. Uh, and there's other things, other things that have emerged through the course of the project as well in terms of looking at lowlands. We've done lots and lots of work on crop mark sites, in particular uh, ploughed out Neolithic and Bronze Age burial and ceremonial and settlement sites. And we've been looking at, we're looking going forward at things like the management of crop mark sites. And also, it's, it's an indication that sometimes sites which appear on the face of it to be destroyed by ploughing actually are hiding really incredible depth, which is what we found at Fortivia in particular. And also there's been a big strand of upland archaeology in the project as well. And this and, um, and Sophie mentioned this this morning, talking about Moncrief. And Tessa Poller single-handedly has excavated bits of about 12 different enclosures on the south side of the valley, mostly in upland areas, to try and give a sense of the of the either the later Iron Age or the Iron Age or into the early medieval period use of these sites. And part of that was the identification of a brock at Castle Craig, which, which Heather excavated. Um, so there's been a whole range of different strands to this project and there's also been some work looking at early churches as well so it's very broad brush and i guess that it's only within the framework of a big academic project that you can really have the the luxury and the time to um, develop all of these different um, strands of the project so we realize we've been very fortunate to have the indulgence of the archaeological community and also lots of money from hes to make this happen so now we have to deliver on that obviously we're trying to transform our understanding of various different aspects of scotland's archaeology um, and we're doing that through the kind of the ongoing writing up process. CERF was a big project and I'm not going to labour this point, but there's lots of different um, numbers that we can look at that kind of indicates um, and this is really just the kind of the core excavation stuff. So we had over 450 students who came through the system, mostly Glasgow and Aberdeen students who were trained, many of whom are now employed in Scottish archaeology and beyond and a few are in the audience today. Um, We've worked with various volunteers, not as many as we should have, but we've had with elements of community archaeology and what we've done. Um, and more crucially, we've done. there's been a lot of archaeology, a lot of work done, including excavating 56 trenches, um, which is in, includes some small trenches, but also some very big ones as well, uh, and all sorts of other things, including a huge area geophysical survey that was carried out in 2013. Um, so it's been a, it's a substantial project uh, and something that's involved a huge amount of time and effort. And with that um, has been a lot of really in, important and exciting discoveries. In terms of um, the elements of the project I've been responsible for to an extent, although more recently Dean Wright has um, taken on a lot of this work. Um, in terms of prehistoric surf part of the project, we've undertaken 10 seasons of excavation, which is terrifying sounding really, um, far too many. Four south of Fertivia and six around Dunning. Um, We've opened, and with it, just looking at the prehistoric sites, 23 trenches, and 20 of those were open area excavations of crop mark sites. So we've got a very good sense of a whole range of different crop marks, and also a couple of sites, one of which was a, was a Kerb Cairn, and the other Dunnock Hill Fort, which accidentally turned out to be have a Neolithic phase to it, which we didn't really expect. Uh, and we've, ex we've investigated during the course of the project all of these different things, a Mesolithic pit alignment, two palisaded enclosures, five henges, etc, etc. So, it's, so this gives you a sense, really, without getting any detail here, of the broad range of types of sites we've excavated and the, the, and, and the, the, the potentially significant narrative that can emerge from this kind of work, especially underpinned by um, a huge amount of radiocarbon dates. Um, and that's something we've been we've trying to develop as the project goes on, so that this is quite chronologically secure. <laughs> um, and in terms of um, excavations, again, just very quickly to flash up here, uh, the, the sites that in the focus of the work that Gordon, uh, Dean and I have worked on over the, the course of the SERF project um, have been focused around <laughs> Fortivia in the early part of the project. Uh, we had a year off in 2011, uh, and then we have excavations around Ledketty, Baldinis and Well Hill to the north of uh, Dunning, and also the wonderfully named Cranberry, uh, and Millhaw to the southwest of Dunning, um, on the on the road, just just to, just to the south of the road out to Ochter Ardor. And this is these are all trenches and sites that primarily were focused on looking at what appear to be Neolithic and Bronze Age monument complexes. But within this, we identified Mesolithic features and also later prehistoric um, information uh, sites as well. As and we also got all of these different annoying Pictish interventions into the middle of Henges in particular. So there was a lot of um, big open area excavations as part of this. Um, and again, just to emphasize, this is only a part of the SERF project. Um, this is a plan that shows, uh, this is Tessa on her own, who has, who has carried out investigations at all of these different forts and hill forts. 
which <laughs> complement quite nicely the work at Moncrief and more Dunhill. Um, and Tessa likes to excavate in these kind of uh, snowy conditions, so you have to remove the snow from the site before you uh, de-turf. Um, and this is something which, again, is going to be a significant strand of our publication strategy going forward, filling in a huge amount of gaps in terms of understanding of the upland sites along here. And, and more or less all of the, these sites appear to be Iron Age. So again, there's not a huge amount of Pictish material coming out of any of these sites. Just to give you a sense of the kind of the, the density of the work we've been doing, it's been based on a really incredible crop mark record, which has been emerging and developing since the early 1970s, firstly by Kenneth and Joseph, and then built on by the Royal Commission's Air Survey Program, um, which has included, for instance, flying over and recording crop marks at Leadketty um, over 30 times since 1976. And the crop mark sites here include palisaded enclosure, a possible causewood enclosure, all sorts of other pits and barrows and structures and ring ditches, um, which have been the focus of a whole range of different excavations. So in this area alone, we've done work looking at the various different later Neolithic monument complex features. Um, I um, accidentally found some Iron Age stuff down in the, the, to the south of the enclosure. Uh, and Dean um, found a Mesolithic pit alignment uh, at Well Hill. He thought might be that based on its similarity as a crop mark to, um, to Krathis. And uh, and also various other ploughed out barrows and things. So again, we're working with a very dense crop mark record, and all of the red features on this illustration here are all um, from Royal Commission transcriptions, which are showing uh, crop marks, uh, and the yellow features are kind of are, are geological um, geological markings, and the green are rig and furrow. So there's a huge amount of crop mark density here, which we're starting to explore and finding stuff. In this case, it goes back to um, back between seven and eight thousand years in some cases. So this is a big, there's a big list here, but it's just, this is me just boasting now and showing off. Uh, these are, these are, what, are what I would say are some of the kind of the headline significant prehistoric discoveries of the SERF project. Um, the Mesolithic pit alignment at, um, at Well Hill is one of only three that's been identified in Scotland, and there's virtually no other examples known elsewhere in northwest Europe. Uh, Dunnock, we've identified an early Neolithic hilltop enclosure. Um, again, incredibly rare in Scotland. You have to go to the north of England to find other parallels. Uh, we found potentially early Neolithic field systems and ard marks at Well Hill and Cranberry. Uh, for Teviot, we found um, an extensive late Neolithic cremation cemetery, uh, and we also found there um, some the post excavation analysis has, has shown some interesting um, practices associated with the human remains there, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes. Uh, we also found very large assemblages of very, various different types of pottery, uh, including some grooveware which Mike has looked at, um, which was found at Leadketty but none, no groove wear it for TV, interestingly, so the, that site was kept clean of late Neolithic material. Uh, and also lots of beakers from for TV as well. Um, we've also got a really bizarre triple kist that we found uh, for TV, although it's probably actually a double kist that had a third quite rubbish compartment inserted into one end of it. Um, and that seems to have been opened up and reused again in the early medieval or the late Iron Age period. Uh, and then uh, for TV, we found uh, a, a spectacular dagger burial in 2009, including the first definitive evidence for flowers ever found in a Bronze Age burial in Britain, because we found the flowers um, as opposed to pollen. And also a very complete example of a Bronze Age fire making kit, um, which um, is maybe uh, one of the most complete examples of, of, uh, uh, of in Europe. Um, I'm not sure if Alison quite agrees with that, but uh, it's not it's up there with Otzi, the Iceman, by all accounts. Uh, and then also, um, we've got other things that are more for the for the Neolithic buffs amongst you, the, nice, the blocking of a henge monument for Tiviot, i.e. the removal of a causeway and converting it into a barrow, which is a nice and unusual discovery. And then the point number 10 is, 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 the, is the almost continual discovery of Pictish activity and material within the Neolithic monuments, in particular in for Tiviot. So all of the henges have massive pits in the centre that were dug in the 5th to 6th centuries AD. And it's probable that material is being removed from inside the henges. Um, and Steve, Steve would argue that perhaps this was the, the, the Pictish kings trying to make connections with these kind of mythical ancestors. So there's definitely a very, a very um, tangible interest being shown in the, in the prehistoric archaeology of Fertiviot by those pesky Picts who seem to, be, um, seem to like to um, knacker the nice Neolithic archaeology. Goodness knows what they found and, and removed. So... These are, and these are the headlines. We found a lot of boring stuff as well. Uh, and, and again, this is just to give a sense. 
um, that chronology is quite important with all of this and so we've been fortunate to be able to get big assemblages of radiocarbon dates including over 100 dates related to the prehistoric side of the project um, and once you start to analyse these and these are, this is an old fashioned kind of visual analysis of the dates um, we start to identify areas of continuity and also um, gaps and voids as well so we have the two main periods of significance for TV for instance in these dates we have the, the third millennium BC where we have the rise and fall of a huge monument complex and then we have a, a sort of a, 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 um, a lacuna in the middle where not much is happening and then we have the gradual reuse of this location through the reuse of Neolithic monuments but also the establishment of an extensive Pictish uh, square barrow cemetery and, and flat grave cemetery as well. So we have the dates can start to give us a sense of that and we've also been doing um, Bayesian analysis of the dates uh, undertaken by Derek Hamilton from Suerk so there's been a lot there's a lot of stuff going on and this will you can you can appreciate that to make sense of this and bring it all together is a, is, a, is actually a, a massive um, undertaking which is actually on a par with the, the actual gathering of the data in the first place so we're now in what we would what we could say is informally kind of phase three of the project which is doing post excavation work and trying to sort out the archive and writing things up and the post excavation process of course has been going right from the start when we started to find things but there's still work going on related to various different aspects of the, the assemblage um, and sometimes we revisit things again just because we need to fill in some gaps in our knowledge and understanding. So we've gone from the kind of the glamour of standing out in fields in Persia and finding a lot of exciting things to sitting in offices with lots of paper and um, looking at spreadsheets and trying to make sense of things and we've got people have been working in laboratories and so on to try and pull all these things together. So this is an equally important part of the archaeological process but it's maybe one that's more often happens behind closed doors um, and so it's not as easy to have an, an open day for an ex a post-excavation exercise but maybe that's the kind of things we should be thinking about doing because it's actually quite useful for people to get a sense of what's involved in trying to pull this kind of process together and a, a couple of examples just to sort of show the information that we're getting here um, that I want to, that, that will kind of give a sense of some of the work that's been going on or is still um, or, or is happening and going on into the future so one of the things that was really striking about the uh, about some of the, the work we did at Fortiviat was the discovery of a, a, a cremation cemetery inside one of the Henge monuments. And when Gordon and I found this, we assumed it was a Bronze Age uh, cremation cemetery. It was only when we got the radiocarbon dates in that we re revised that opinion and it dated to um, just at the start of the third, the, the third millennium BC. And it's almost exactly contemporary with a similar but larger cremation cemetery at Stonehenge. So this immediately gives us a nice context for the site. Um, and so all of the bone here has been analysed by Stephanie Leach. Um, the, the pins and um, a, a chafing vessel pot has been looked at by Alison for us. Uh, and Marion did these nice drawings of the pins. And we can start to pull this together and make sense of this site. as a, This is a, as a, as a really significant point in time. Because although we've looked at these big monuments and there's lots of spectacular stuff, what we have in this cremation cemetery is a very humble beginning of an enormous monument complex. And this is the first thing that really happened at Fortivia. We've almost nothing happening before 3000 BC. This cemetery is established and then everything else spins off that. And in fact, this cemetery was a focus for enclosure and activity for almost a thousand years after its establishment. And the Bronze Age dagger burial was, um, was located about five metres from the cremation cemetery, but 900 years later. So there's a really, really spectacular connections being made here. Uh, and the analysis here showed that a lot of the remains are co-mingled. So in other words, there are more than one person's cremated remains in the same deposit, which suggests that either people were, um, were dying at the same time or were being connected together in death, or they were curating some remains until someone else died and adding those together for the burial. So it gives us an insight into the kind of processes that are going on, as well as how efficient the, the pyre process and so on. And there's lots of things we can say about this, but one of the things that seems to be a recurring theme is an association with, with um, remains of uh, adults and children within the same deposits. So again, there's, there's a story there about the, the types of relationships that are being encapsulated within this cemetery, which, are, which only comes through, th through the careful analysis of all of these cremated remains. And the Bayesian analysis um, has, has been undertaken of that. Those dates, by de those, the, the dates we got from the cremated bone in this cemetery allows us to kind of pin down roughly when we think that the event started and began, um, ended and also we can then start to put it into a broader British Neolithic context. Uh, and that's something which suggests that this was a significant cremation um, cemetery right at the start of the kind of the, uh, a sort of a, 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 an emergence of cremation as a, as a major practice in Neolithic burial traditions uh, and something which connects 
for TV at closely to Stonehenge in terms of thing, very similar things happening. Cremation Cemetery, then big monumental um, explosion. The dagger burial is something that's been worked on by a huge team of people. Uh, uh, they, these are the, the famous flower heads that are um, the square. The square behind here is two millimetres across. So these are very small, um, but these are meadow sweet flower heads. And we found loads and loads of these and also stalks of the, of the plants and also lots of flowers, uh, uh, lots of um, pollen as well, suggesting that this person that was buried in this kist, and unfortunately their body did not survive, um, was buried with a lot of flowers, which probably suggests they were buried late in the summer, and maybe also that, the, there was a, that it was a very smelly burial. Maybe the body was lying around for a while in order for the stuff to be brought together to make this grave, um, and therefore we've got, this, we've got this profusion of flowers going in here, which again is an interesting narrative and insight into Bronze Age funerary practice. And then the dagger here, which has been looked at by various people, a really spectacular object with a bronze blade, um, including a nice gold um, pommel, which, uh, um, sorry, gold hilt band. Alison at break was um, reminding me, it seems to be from, made of Cornish gold, which is fantastic. And, um, and at the end, there's a pommel, which you can't really see in that image there, which is made from the tooth of a sperm whale, which is amazing. So we've got this is an, incre an incredible object. Um, and lots of people working on it. Um, there's a team of people. These are the people named at the bottom here are alone. The people who have been helping, as well as Alison, have been helping with things like the fire making kit, where we found, thank you, we found the flint striker light, a piece of iron ore, um, punk in the form of a um, of a um, hoof um, fungus, which is probably what kept the kept the the, fl the spark um, smouldering until it could be turned into fire. And also probably this was contained within a leather bag. Um, and all of those components together makes this a very exciting um, uh, discovery. And hopefully going forward we can start to do some experimental archaeology and I'm hoping we can maybe recreate elements of this, um, of this uh, fire making kit, um, which was um, something of a specialism of Patrick Crave Brown, um, um, well known to members of the Archaeology Society, of Archaeology Scotland. Well Hill, um, we've got this uh, discovery, this very sexy discovery of ard marks, this, um, which you can barely see in um, that picture on the top right. Um, the Mesolithic Pitalime, it's very exciting. The ard marks are also potentially interesting. Circumstantially, we might be able to date those to the early Neolithic with a general association with a big assemblage of early Neolithic pottery. Um, and again, post-excavation work here has included doing um, this ongoing lipid analysis of the carinated ware assemblages from this site and some of the other sites in the second phase of the project, um, which Alex Ale Alexander's doing for us, funded by HES. And, also, and that will hopefully reveal results which are similar to the kinds of things that were um, talked about in the previous talk um, by Mike and Alison about the, the kind of things that pottery vessels may have been holding. And, we've all, and, and, and Gordon and I have also, or Dean and I sort of also worked up an article which has been submitted to Antiquity, which is pulling together evidence for possible art marks and fuel banks of Neolithic date across Scotland. So it's kind of, so the, the, the one little discovery at um, Well Hill is sort of catalyzing a whole range of other bits of research um, that we're trying to pull together to again help broaden our understanding of the Scottish Neolithic. And then we've got an enormous archive. This is for you, Kirsty. So stop looking at your phone when you're on the screen. <laughs> so, yeah, so this is so we've got we've got um, literally thousands and thousands of photographs that are being catalogued and worked on, and we're having someone starting in the summer who's going to be working properly on um, sorting out all of the archive. We've still got drawings we're working on. There's all sorts of things going on, which again are as another hidden part of the excavation process which um, is something which, um, which has to be done because this has to be usable in the future, not just in a digital form, but also in a hard, a hard copy form as well. And at some point, no doubt, the, um, the National Monuments Record, the, the, what are they called now? The National Environment, whatever it's called now, um, will be getting um, many boxes full of stuff um, with this archive as well as digital versions. Um, I'll just finish by saying a few words about our publication and dissemination strategy, another, another glamorous element of the whole process. Of course, one of the things we have to do here is make sure this all um, is published and as accessible as possible. Um, and we're doing this in a, in a rather old-fashioned way, Simon. I know that you've, 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 you've thoughts on this. But one of the things that we were doing is working on a series of uh, monographs with this, the CBA. Uh, and the first of those, Prehistoric <coughs> Fortiviate and Royal Fortiviate, um, will probably be coming out um, in the next um, 18 months. Uh, and then there's other books to follow as well. And one of the reasons behind this, which is still a very old-fashioned, in a way, a, a kind of an, an un, unhelpful form of publication, is the driver of the REF process within universities, where these types of monographs are viewed as the gold standard in academic publications. So in a sense, um, our university managers 
insist that we are doing this kind of publishing, even though this is probably not the best way to disseminate the results of these excavations. And having spent six months painfully writing prehistoric for TV, it's not probably not it's probably not any, not anyone's idea of fun, but hopefully at least the book will have nice pictures for people to look at at the end of the process. But also, we've been writing lots of academic journal papers. HES are now making sure that all of our publications are open access so everyone can read them. So, for instance, the paper about the cremation cemetery that was in last year's Proceedings of the Prehistoric Society is open access and free for anyone who, to read online, and that will be the same for our other papers going forward. Um, we're also um, putting as much of our stuff as we can online on our website. All of our interim reports and interim statements um, going back to 2006 are available on the SERF website, which will be on the last slide. Uh, and we've also got um, the Cradle of Scotland exhibition that was in the Hunterian Museum, then Perth Museum, which is now an online version, and an, a, a fantastic um, digital Hillfort uh, um, app, uh, application that was developed with Tessa Poller and various other people, which is online and which kind of gives a bit more of an insight into the post-excavation process. Um, we also use social media, so you can follow us on um, Surf Project on Twitter. Uh, and um, for instance, I've been tweeting about a lot of the work that's been going on in the last few months. So if you search under hashtag for TV at Kist, you'll find out various things about the Kist burial. Um, and we hopefully at the end of this process, we'll also have um, a popular book, which will be something you can pick up at a reasonable price off a bookshelf. And we'll explain what we found over the project without having to read about 40,000 context numbers and that kind of thing. So, so that's maybe, that maybe is where the, the line will be drawn under this process. And there's all sorts of other things that are going forward as well, which are the other side of a modern archaeological project, community engagement, legacy type projects, trying to use the stuff that we've found to benefit the wider community, whether that be about raising awareness and helping support local heritage groups and local communities, um, helping with information and moving things forward, like the redisplay of the Fertivia um, carved stones in the church and so on, um, and the work we've been doing with schools through the course of the project. So there's lots and lots of things that are going on um, through the project. And yes, we even got to meet Prince William. Um, and that is actually, that is uh, him holding um, our surf booklet that tells a little bit about the first part of the project. I'm pretty sure that he got back in his um, limo and just tossed it in the back. But anyway, he did have that and he got to shake Steve Driscoll's uh, sweaty hand. So that was, a, that was fun for, for all of us. <laughs> so so um, don't imagine that when an excavation finishes, that's the end of the hard work. Sometimes the hard work only, only really begins when the final bit of the trench is closed and you have to go back and face the long, dark tea time of the archive and try and make sense of it all. And hopefully... The process, the outcome of this will be um, some amazing, uh, some amazing publications and outcomes over the next five to ten years. <laughs> okay, there's there's some websites at the end if you want to follow them up. So thank you very much for your attention. Mm -hmm.